Bienvenidos a la noche cósmica de la oveja eléctrica, aquí en Canal 22, en donde hoy vamos a hacer un viaje al fondo de la naturaleza y al fondo del ser. Vamos a explorar una pregunta polémica que ha inquietado a físicos de la talla de los premios Nobel Eugene Bickner y Roger Penrose. ¿Cuál es la relación entre la materia y la conciencia? El físico francés Bernard Despañat, en un texto publicado por la revista Scientific American, señalaba que la doctrina de que el mundo está formado por objetos cuya existencia es independiente de la conciencia humana, resulta estar en conflicto con la mecánica cuántica y con los hechos establecidos por los experimentos. Max Planck decía que al adentrarnos en la realidad ya no existe la materia como tal. Como señalaba el físico Sir James Jeans, el universo comienza a parecerse más a un gran pensamiento que a una inmensa máquina. En la segunda y última parte de una interesante conversación, Tony Nader, doctor en neurociencia por el MIT, Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts, nos habla de cómo cuando la física se interna en la materia, se abren campos abstractos que parecen estar vinculados con la conciencia, con el observador. And what scientists has found, and that's why these great uh, scientists and physicists have said, is that this has a connectedness with consciousness. And what they discovered is that particles, fluctuations of the fields are non-local, which means they are not concentrated in one place, they are spread out. And when we look at them, when we observe them, they collapse into a specific object. This collapse of the wave function, they call it, which means the probability of finding an object anywhere. And this collapse, it seems to be connected to consciousness. And that's why some of these great scientists have said that ultimately it's a great consciousness value. Now, if it is, and we know it is, I know it is, I feel it is, <laughs> it is, it must be possible from consciousness to create changes in the physical matter. And that's what we find through, for example, transcendental meditation, which is a technique of consciousness to develop consciousness and to go deeper into one's own personal consciousness. And people who practice transcendental meditation, they have changes in their physiology, in their brain waves, in their uh, chemicals in the brain, in the body, and balance in the physiology that happens through a transcending through an experience on the mental level. And modern science knows that there is effect from the mind on the nervous system, from the nervous system, on the hormonal system, from the hormonal system, on the immune system. This is very well established axis which is, has even a, a name, psycho, neuro, endocrino, immunology. So there is an axis of action that shows that what you hold in your mind can have an effect on your body. That's one aspect, but that's on the personal physical aspect. What we have found also is when pe people practice this meditation, deep meditation together, they create an effect in society. And there are many studies that have shown reduction in crime, reduction in conflict, improvement in social indicators, improvement in and prosperity in the society. And these have been repeated many times to the astonishment of scientists because how can this happen? And this is really to answer your very well clear question. If consciousness is primary, then from consciousness, we should be able to make change in the physiology. And that is, you know, on the practical level has been also tried and proven that we can do that for the individual and for the collection of individuals in society. Es claro que la mente afecta a la materia de la que está hecha nuestro cuerpo y viceversa. El funcionamiento de la fisiología afecta a nuestra percepción. ¿Podrían ser dos caras de la misma moneda? ¿Cuáles serían las implicaciones y efectos de una íntima relación entre conciencia y materia en nuestro entorno? ¿Cómo podríamos abrirnos a estados más refinados de percepción? ¿Qué es lo que se descubre en este viaje al fondo del ser y de la naturaleza? 
De ello hablaremos después del corte. de rayo con tintes verdes y dorados hacemos sinapsis en nuestros cerebros en la noche cósmica de la oveja eléctrica aquí en canal 22 en donde vamos a ver si podemos abrirnos a una percepción que está más allá de los límites que solemos apreciar el poeta William Blake decía que si limpiáramos las ventanas de la percepción veríamos la realidad como es infinita sin embargo lo que es claro es que tenemos tantas modalidades fragmentadas de nuestra percepción que tendríamos que ver si podríamos experimentar un silencio común, un estado básico fundamental de la conciencia más allá de nuestras diferencias. De ello, vamos a conversar con Tony Nader, doctor en neurociencias por el MIT, el Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts. But for that, we should have a unified theory of consciousness, because the problem is that we define consciousness in such many ways, and we would have to have some experience of consciousness that is different to the ways that we usually uh, experience it. You studied medicine, psychiatry, and neurology at Harvard University to try to understand why, while we are so similar, We can be so different in our opinions, mindsets, and points of view. Let's talk about the search of a unified a field of consciousness, and if we can have it, if we can have this experience, because this would mean uh, to to meet uh, some level of, of silence within that is common to to everybody. How can we have this experience? This This uh, talks about uh, different states of consciousness that usually we don't have. That's beautiful. Yes, exactly. Um, we perceive things through our lenses, our uh, build up, which is made out of these complex, uh, as you said, the mirrors that we look at from different qualities, different aspects, leads to patterns of consciousness within ourselves. And if there is distortion in the mirror or distortion in the quality of the screen that is on which the movie of life is happening, then the movie is not the same. And therefore, what we want to call this is stress. Let's call it stress. Stress is a term that has also many interpretations and many ways to look at it. But let's call anything that distorts or disturbs the perfect functioning or the perfect pattern of functioning of our activities of consciousness, of our nervous system, as being stress. And therefore, we see things through different perspectives. Some of us who have you know, prejudice in this way, believe in that way, expectation in that way, it's like wearing glasses. And you wear the red glasses, and things appear red and you wear the yellow glasses and things appear yellow. So you are sure this is yellow, you are sure this is red, but this is because you have a filter, you are not looking through clear, clean lenses. Now, what is consciousness? Is it the red consciousness, the right consciousness, or is it the yellow consciousness, the correct consciousness? And that is, both are correct on their own level of perspective and both perspective. Transcendental meditation, again, I mentioned this because this technique gives true understanding of what is to go beyond, that is why the term transcending, to transcend, to go beyond the surface value to the original value, which is within ourselves. So what we do is you close the eyes and there is a technique. It allows you the mind to settle down, settle down. And if the mind is like an ocean active on its surface and more and more quiet in its depths, the more deep you go into the ocean, the more you are quiet, you are settled, you are settled. So when you use this technique and settle down your mind, it settles down and settles down and settles down, you end up experiencing 
consciousness by itself, which is something very unusual because usually we are always conscious of something, of an object, of a thought, of a feeling, of um, memory, of a future plan. So we are always thinking of something, of something. In this case, you transcend, which means you go beyond and you experience pure consciousness, which means you experience one field of unbounded awareness where consciousness is by itself without any object on the surface. So consciousness experiencing itself takes us to the primordial consciousness, to the one unbounded ocean of consciousness, which is, we can say, the unified field that we talked about in physics, you know, coming to this physics, and deeper. Physics just glimpses it. It, it hasn't proved it, but it, it glimpses it. Exactly, exactly. Physics is glimpsing that because as they, they started to go deeper, they start to realize there is more and more unification. And now there are theories uh, to explain, like the M theory, the super string theory, to explain how it's possible that this is the case. So it is not like definitely proven experimentally, but theoretically there are, you know, this kind of uh, idea about one field. We're taking it as an, as an example. It's not also the proof that there is, that consciousness is the one unbounded ocean and that is the source of everything. But it gives us reassurance that if we keep moving in this direction, we're not going into some Uh, fancy, crazy kind of realm, but it looks like nature is moving in this way. So uh, the physics doesn't prove that, but it gives us an idea that it could really be, uh, it could really be the case. La ciencia nos da apenas atisbos de un nivel de la naturaleza en donde todo podría estar unificado. El gran salto sería integrar en estas búsquedas al observador. Ese es un sueño que expresó hermosamente el gran novelista Amos Oz. En una conversación que sostuve con él, hablamos de una de sus novelas en donde el personaje central es un físico que descubre un elegante teorema que unifica a todas las fuerzas de la naturaleza. Y así plantea que no tan solo se deben de integrar la fuerza de la gravedad con el electromagnetismo, sino que también con la fuerza del deseo y de la pasión. La conciencia debe de estar integrada en la ecuación. Más adelante seguiremos conversando sobre la posibilidad de experimentar una percepción ilimitada, un viaje al fondo de la naturaleza y de nuestro propio ser. En un parpadeo cósmico en donde tenemos un atisbo de la percepción ilimitada, volvemos a la oveja eléctrica con todas las neuronas encendidas. Como de rayo con tintes verdes y dorados, encendemos las neuronas de nuestros cerebros y hacemos sinapsis en las constelaciones de la noche cósmica de la oveja eléctrica, aquí en Canal 22, en donde estamos conversando con el doctor Tony Nader, neurocientífico del Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts, cuyo libro más reciente se titula Un océano ilimitado de conciencia. Este libro aborda una experiencia de percepción sin fronteras que está correlacionada con el funcionamiento coherente de las ondas cerebrales. En una conversación que sostuvimos con el gran cineasta David Lynch en el marco de la LEF, el Festival de Arte y Ciencia de la UNAM, esto es lo que nos comentó David Lynch sobre la posibilidad de esta experiencia. Consciousness, every human being has consciousness, but not every human being has the same amount. But the good news is the potential for every one of us human beings is unbounded consciousness, infinite amount of consciousness. There is an ocean of consciousness, an unbounded eternal of con uh, ocean of consciousness within each one of us human beings. As we're sitting in, uh, in their chairs today, within each of us is an ocean of pure, unbounded consciousness. We've just lost uh, contact with that 
beautiful ocean, the big treasury within us all. David Lynch plantea que esta experiencia de ilimitación está íntimamente ligada a su creatividad. Mientras más ensancha la mirada, la percepción, las ideas fluyen más fácilmente como hermosos peces. El doctor Tony Nader, médico experto en neurociencia, nos habla del mecanismo de la experiencia directa de este campo que se descubre en el interior de la conciencia y que también se corrobora con los estudios científicos y los testimonios de diversas culturas, de poetas y escritores como Aldous Huxley. And so, uh, when you experience this personally, and thousands, millions of people have had this dive within themselves, and they come to that field which is unified, and therefore, on the level of experience, because it's all about consciousness after all, then you do find that there is one consciousness, that is one field of awareness, that is the pure being, pure consciousness, and that is what, uh, you know, I describe as the source of everything. That is truly the unified field that the scientists are looking for. And, you know, at the end of the day, we are talking about the need to understand the big questions of life, the questions that supposedly when we grow, we should not dare to ask. But the impulse of knowledge cannot be suppressed. That's the spirit of science, to trying to understand where do we come from. Please talk, us, please talk to us in a personal note about your seeking process through science, through philosophy, through art, through meditation, West meeting East, modern science meeting ancient wisdom. Beautiful, yes. Uh, I was also feeling like everybody that it is the material that creates the mental. And therefore, that's why I studied medicine and psychiatry and neurology and went into research also to see how the physical comes together to create this uh, ability to decide and to, uh, to make decisions that are either evolutionary or not, uh, that help us grow as a society, that are potentially can give us peace and happiness and harmony in society. And I found that the answers were not there because not the logic is not there or not the mechanisms are not there. But ultimately, that the starting point is not the right one. If you start from a an, an supposition or a theory or you start with an axiom and the axiom is not right, then even if you make the right, right thinking and the right logic, you cannot find the ultimate answers to the questions. So the ultimate answers to the big questions in life, which are, why are we here? How do we come about? Uh, do we have freedom? Do we have determinism? Do we have, why suffering happen? Why is there evil? Are not able to be answered because the starting point is not the right starting point. And so having discovered within myself that there is this field of inner silence, inner peace, inner happiness that gave me so much strength and energy and ability to concentrate. And then I said, but this is something more holistic. So what if this was the reality? And when you look at all the traditions in the world, the great traditions of knowledge, you find that they point to the same thing. You know, they point to, for example, in the ancient Testament in the Bible, it says humans were created in the image of God. Uh, in the New Testament, Christ says, find the kingdom of heaven that is within you. Uh, in Islam, it says, uh, God says, I am nearer to you than your jugular vein. Uh, uh, and other prophets, they say, uh, consider yourself as an atom like an atom in which the whole universe folded itself. And like this, you go to the Tao and, and uh, ancient Chinese knowledge. It says the same thing, that you are that totality, you are the wholeness. You go to the East, farther in the ancient, more ancient, the Veda, it says everything is wholeness, everything is totality, you are the source of everything is within you. So this is wisdom, of course, and philosophy, 
and there are Greek philosophers and uh, you know modern philosophers on the, in the West and modern thinkers that have pointed to this value. And now science from the objective level brings us to this potential glimpse of the unified field. So it's all leading us from the subjective side as well as from the objective scientific side to the same unity at the origin of diversity. And that unity is transcendental and it can explain all the other values. So even in my personal life, my personal experience, my research in all these fields led me to the one conclusion that I feel solves the problems and answers the questions on all these different layers. And that's why I have wanted to share this and, and I'm grateful to be with you and to discuss these points with you. You know, it's very interesting because uh, at the end, it has to do with experience, no? You, 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 you explain the maps that are there, but if there is not experience, then we are not able to grasp it. At the core of your quest, there is the compassion that seeks to alleviate suffering and to bring not the superficial sugar-coated and fake joy, but something that is enduring, lasting, meaningful. And so there is a logic, there is a reason for things, and there is a wholeness uh, in life that permeates our existence. Dr. Tony Nader, thank you. Thank you very much for this interview that uh, talks to us about the need of expanding awareness and finding other registers of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Pepe. Los mapas de una profunda unidad de la vida sin la experiencia directa no tienen sentido. Se debe de ir más allá de las creencias, investigar científicamente lo que pasa en el cerebro para ver si es posible romper los límites usuales de la percepción. Me quedo con un testimonio, con una descripción de Aldous Huxley que nos habla del poder de la experiencia de la unidad en medio de la diversidad. Decía Huxley, cuando nos sentimos dignos herederos del universo, cuando el mar fluye en nuestras venas y las estrellas son nuestras joyas, cuando todas las cosas se perciben como infinitas y sagradas, ¿qué motivo podemos tener para la codicia o la presunción o por la búsqueda de poder o las formas más tristes del placer? ¿Nuestra experiencia directa y percepción genuina podría estar a la altura de esta descripción de Huxley? Esa es la gran pregunta que está en el trasfondo de las investigaciones del doctor Tony Nader. Un gusto contar con su presencia en la oveja eléctrica. Y continuamos ahora el viaje al fondo del ser y de la naturaleza con la brújula de la música de nuestro entrañable cantautor cósmico, Fernando Rivera Calderón. Pues querido Fernando Rivera Calderón, bienvenido a estos escenarios cósmicos de la oveja eléctrica con tu pandero eléctrico. Me encanta tu pandero eléctrico, además es el único en su especie, mi querido Fernando. Sí, porque es inalámbrico. <risa> es inalámbrico, sí, es una maravilla, es de la tecnología. <risa> Oye, eh, hablemos el día de hoy, ¿a dónde quieres viajar precisamente en estos escenarios cósmicos? Pues mira, lamentablemente por la pandemia y por el presupuesto, el único viaje que me queda es este... No, no vamos a hacer aquí apología de ninguna sustancia, simplemente a decir que solo me queda viajar al fondo de mí, Pepe. Eso es muy importante. Con la meditación, como tú lo haces, ah. que ya me vas a enseñar. Para que, claro que para sí. Para que ya deje de estar, este, como dice mamá, ya no tomes, cómprate ropita. <risa> Voy a viajar al fondo de mi ser, a conocer al verdadero fe. Voy a viajar al fondo ya de mí, para ver si me escapo yo de aquí. Voy a viajar al fondo de mi ser, a ver si soy yo solo es parecer. Voy a viajar al fondo de mi alma, para ver si así me encuentro yo la calma. Voy a viajar, voy a viajar, a ver si puedo yo un día llegar. A ese lugar, a ese lugar, a donde todo fue a comenzar. Voy a viajar, voy a viajar. A ver si puedo yo un día llegar a ese lugar, a ese lugar, a donde todo fue a comenzar y a terminar. 
ya comenzar, ya termina, ya comenzar, ya termina. Ahora sí termina. <risa>